My name's Al Van Wyp. Um, I've been a member here for about 21, almost coming up on 22 years. We were pregnant with uh, our oldest child when we started here. Um, and she is now a senior at St. Olaf College. So. Excuse me. Excuse me, coffee hour folks. <laughs> coffee hour folks. Excuse me, please. We have adult education in the sanctuary today. And so if we're able to have your conversations a little more quietly or perhaps in another part of the building or coming to the sanctuary. Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. Again, uh, my name is Al Van Lent. This is my uh, third time doing this presentation um, on the stained glass. It's just something that kind of sparked my interest uh, quite a few years ago when I talked to the pastors at that time. I said, hey, let's, let's do something that um, we can all enjoy and understand what's all in these windows. There's, there's stuff in here that, you know, we, we come here every week, sometimes multiple times a week, and you really don't know what's in the windows. And I'd like to start off by just um, with a little quote from um, Pastor Niebling. Everybody knows who Pastor Niebling was. He was our pastor from 1921 to 1967. He was our first senior pastor. And he said, one of the most ancient and effective forms of visual aid to religious education and worship is stained glass. From its beginning in the third and fourth century, stained glass rose to the heights of its glory in the cathedrals of Europe. And at no time in history was the color of stained glass more vibrant and jewel-like. Now, before we start, um, the, the information that I got initially was from a book put together by Pastor Niebling. Um, they just recently um, put together a new book. A very, very nice. Pastor Chris went through, you know, I don't know if you guys know, he's pretty good with the camera. Um, so he's gone through and he put together, and I'll let, let him attempt to talk a little bit about this. <laughs> We do, um, we do have the books today. They are at the Information Center, and I have a box up here. I don't know if people want them as we're going through this. You can raise your hand, and I can give those to you if you want. So, we have a bunch. Um, essentially, Pastor Nibley, uh in 1951, and I'll probably talk about this, put them, uh, once we finished construction of this space, so the long space, um, 1950, uh, one year later, they commissioned um, adding all of our stained glass windows. The windows used to go all the way down the side of the nave, the church space, here. When we renovated in 2000, we repositioned a whole bunch of them, as many of you know. Um, so they are really beautiful. They're one of my favorite um, styles of stained glass in Milwaukee. Uh, really have a nice look. Um, when he finished this, though, he did a little booklet. They were hoping to do a, a color booklet, but really didn't have the funds, didn't have the resources to do it. So they put together just a little, uh, little booklet, uh, very small. And so the booklet we have today that I created, um, that we put together, is essentially his. So it's, it's his booklet. We used all of his words. Um, Linda Chadwick uh, did all the work of actually putting it together. I just did the photography. Um, but we wanted to really have that sense of having the, the book as something that people could have, take home, um, and remind us of the beauty of this of the stained glass. So, um, so it's, it's a nice, nice piece. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Al to do the class, but I'll put those images up as we go through, too, so we can kind of see them. Right? Thank you, Pastor Chris. And he's supposed to be, yes. I also do 7th grade Sunday school. <laughs> um, just uh, to uh, thank you, Pastor Chris, and just to uh, um, reiterate what he talked about, I always like to start with just a little bit of the history of the church here and what we have and why we have what we have now. Now, all of you know about the original church, correct? Do you all know where the original church is? 
It's right over here. The library is where the altar used to be. And uh, um, what we call the chapel is where everybody sat. So that is the original church with its original windows. So what you see here on this wall. And that was, uh, those were dedicated, uh, uh, the cornerstone was laid on March 8th, 2000, uh, 1921. And then in 1949, they laid the cornerstone for this church, this building. And as Pastor Chris said, it was a long Gothic style church. If you actually come in from the parking lot and look up behind the organ here, you will see in the wall where these windows used to, used to be. So the altar was up here, organ was up in the balcony. The balcony actually extended beyond the, the, the set of rafters and the choir sang up there. That's when I started we were up there. Um, and then it was just long views. Um, and that was all the wall was all wall. So in 2000, we finished it to this particular um, configuration. Um, if, you, if you actually go downstairs, um, one day we initially built in 1951 this church, there were just clear lots. There was no stained glass windows. So if you actually take a look at the fellowship hall, those pictures in the hallway by fellowship hall, you can actually see some of the pictures. They show a picture of the altar. There's no stained glass behind it. It was just clear, um, I believe it was smoked glass. Um, and then they put together a committee and they had a group of people who actually paid for the windows. And I was talking to a longtime member and they said one family paid for the whole, for all three of these Lancet windows. So one, that was by one family and then everybody else throughout the church, um, they were able to pay for that. Um, the, the committee, uh, some of these names you may or may not know were um, uh, Reverend Niebling, Miles Henninger, Robert Potter, Walter Helwig, and Arthur Greedy were the, the committee that put together um, to put the windows in. Um, I had an opportunity to talk with Lois and we talked about a couple years ago about the actual style of church of these windows. You get a lot of stained glass where they just actually cut out the colors and they put them in. This one, if you actually take a closer look at it, you'll see that there's actually like some black powder that was baked onto the windows. And what I, was, what I just strongly suggest, and I'll mention this a couple times, is when we're done, if you actually go up to the commons area, you can get right up to, to some of the windows that were done and you can actually see and, and what the style is and how the intricate work was done. The windows were installed and uh, designed by the T.C. Esser Stained Glass Studios of Milwaukee. And for the most part, the design was by um, Pastor Neely. And if you actually take a look, just the detail of what he put and the story behind each pane that, that, that they put together, you can actually see what he's trying to convey. Um, and one of the statements he, he put in the book, the beauty of one must not detract from the beauty of the other, but rather they must blend harmoniously to create a symphony of grace and enhancement. As you read through this book, the stories that Pastor Niebling, how he explains and why he, they did what they did is just phenomenal. His, his storytelling is really, really interesting. So, the windows themselves. I'm going to concentrate mainly on what we call the, the tripart windows up here, the three. Um, these particular three windows have some very interesting stories within them. As I say, stated before, we, we come every week and we just don't know what's in them. Um, these three windows up here represent um, <clears throat> the hands of three extended fingers, the upper right, is the father. In the middle we have the lamb with the banner of victory is the son. And then on the right we have the descending Pentecostal dove as the Holy Spirit. So we have the father, son, and Holy Spirit. And the stories within each one of those lancet represents that. So what I'd like to do is let's spend a little bit of time on the left lancet here. This, the one that's on this side here.
So as we look at this particular land set, and what I'll do is I'll start from the bottom and work, work our way up. So on the bottom here, this bottom particular panel, is the Prince of the Old Testament, that is Isaiah, in there. And with that, he has the scroll of prophecy concerning the Messiah. So you can see within there, he's holding the scroll. Um, see, there we go. And then right next to it, we have four crowns and, see if I can get this right, Cairo, I think it's pronounced, um, the symbol of Christ. And that, that's just a couple times that shows up within uh, these lancets. But they have the Cairo monogram of Christ. And then we have three, so we have the big crown on top. So we have the big cross on top, which represents Christ. And then we have three smaller crowns underneath. And those uh, suggest the former great worldly kingdoms of Israel, Greece, and Rome. Above Isaiah, and the, the crown up here, we have the Ark of the Covenant, represented by the angels, the cherubims, and uh, the, the abiding presence of God. And that's why those angels are shown on, up there on top. So we have, up there we have the uh, Ark of the Covenant. And then above that, I think we're all familiar with that particular scene, um, is the Nativity of the Lord. And it, again, a lot of what I'm reading, I and mean, I apologize for keep going back to my notes, but I want to make sure I, I portray what Pastor Needling, in his words, it said, the nativity of the Lord, the real abiding presence of God with humanity. And he states, he is surrounded not only by Mary and Joseph, but also by the ox and the ass, as well as the lowly lamb of the fields. All the while, the celestial star sheds its beams upon him who is and always will be hailed as the Lamb of God. So as, as they design this, so you have the, um, you know, you have the nativity scene, and the, the lambs, and in the back you can see the ox, and then the, the star shining down on top of that. And then of course, <clears throat> on the top of this particular lancet, we have the hand of God. Any questions on the left lancet? Just the detail on it, yes. Um, the symbols that are over Mary and Jesus and, uh, and uh, Joseph are... Oh, the halo? The halo there. Um, is that, I mean, they're, they're, throughout all the other panels there are halos as well, and I just, I, I guess those, are those representative of anything particular? Do they mean anything? I think this just represents their, their holiness. I don't know if... Sainthood. Sainthood. So, like, John the Baptist is also has one. Um, he's come to us. So. Kind of, a, lot of the other, a lot of the other images are um, more like um, parables. So, people in the parables might not be considered saints. So, you'll see this often in artwork as well. Uh, with the halo above signifying that it's a, a saint. Thank you. I would just by looking at that, I'd probably say not here because you know, Jesus himself, he's white, yellow, and white. <coughs> And white. So he's on the four times. Um, I, I <clears throat> there's nothing in the book that suggests that, that the colors mean something. So I think it was just a time to get some something different. Any other questions on the left? Well, yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Pastor Nathan did the, the pictures. Did he like draw them and then take them to the glass place and then? Well, there, there was three people involved in the um, design of it. There was a designer, Leo Cartwright, who's the master craftsman, 
and then there's an Earnhardt Stottner, um, and then um, who's the art artesian um, from from uh, ESSer, TSSer. So um, I'm imagining they they work together. I have not seen any hand um, design. And again, you know, he, Pastor Neeling was very much concerned. He didn't want one to stand out from the other. He wanted it all to blend together. Any other questions? Okay, now the center one, um, we're dealing with basically the life of Christ. Um, at the bottom, <clears throat> bottom of the line set, um, we have the grapes planted by the wheat. I uh, think we all know that that symbolizes the Lord's Supper. Um, over the medallion, this is the one that I like. There's, there's a couple panels that I like, but this is, this is the one that I like above it is actually, actually the Last Supper. So it's right up in here. Um, what I like about this particular picture is talking about the halos, first of all. First of all, you'll notice one person is a different color. <laughs> any idea, any guess who that might be? <laughs> and also, that particular person, if you notice, does not have a halo. And we all know that that represents Judas. Um, they wanted that to stand out. So I, that's what I like about this particular panel is how, how they do that, but it just, they make sure that Judas stands out. Also, you'll see that he's uh, clutching um, a bag with all his coins in it. <clears throat> Above the Last Supper is another interesting panel. Um, it is a pelican. And it is interesting this is one that you just don't notice. And what it is, it's, it's a pelican who um, is plucking open her breast to feed her young with her own blood. <clears throat> I had to go do some research on this one <laughs> to find out the significance of it. So um, according to the, the information that I found, um, it says the, the uh, um, the legend of the pelican is an ancient one, and it has few variations. It was adopted by, into Christianity by the second century, when it appeared in the Physiologist, a Christian adaptation of a popular animal legend and symbol. And what this particular book stated was, <clears throat> the little pelicans strike their parents, and their parents striking back, <clears throat> killing them. But on the third day, the mother pelican strikes and opens her side and pours blood onto her dead young. In this way, they are revived and made well. <clears throat> so that is the story about the pelican. So you'll see, it's interesting, when I started doing this and then I had the opportunity, I went to Europe to take a look, uh, I went to a couple of um, cathedrals. You see the pelican in, in various forms. And there'll be another one that's, that's unusual up there that we'll talk about in a little bit, but um, you don't notice that when you're out sitting and you just look at it as a whole, but when you look at the individual panels. So this, this is one of them that I, I, I really am, I like the story behind it. One of the other parts to this is, um, this was a big crusader symbol. So the crusaders used this symbol as well, a sacrificial mother for her young. And you actually can find this symbol in the <coughs> upper room. So the room that's believed to be the room uh, where Jesus had his last supper. They actually have this symbol up on one of the pillars. So, kind of interesting. Oh, I didn't know. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <clears throat> above the falcon, we again have the, uh, um, the Cairo uh, image of uh, the uh, <clears throat> Excuse me, the, the Greek monogram in Cairo for, for that means Christ. And above this, we have the crucifixion. What's interesting about the crucifixion here is there are two people stand, uh, standing at the bottom of, of the cross. Um, 
Obviously, one is Mary, Christ's mother. And the other one is, any idea, anybody would have a guess who the other one would be? John. Uh, John, his beloved disciple, gazing wistfully while apparently pondering the master's question, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And you'll notice in John's arms, he has a book. And according to Pastor Niebling, it says John's arms, a book, reminds us of his final statement. But there are so many other things which Jesus did were every one of them, uh, were every one of them to be written, I suppose the world itself could not contain the books that could be written. <coughs> so that's, you know, so just the details that were put into it, just the little symbolic details and how deep the stories behind them are. And then of course we have up on top, we have the, the Lamb of God, with the uh, banner of victory. Any questions about this? What is I N R I? I N. That's the uh, um, the, the it's Greek, right? Um, Jesus Christ, King of the Jews. It, is it Greek or is it it's Greek? Greek. <coughs> I, where, where was that? Um, Does the book speak to um, Latin. the process of the glass itself? The, the glass itself is not monotone like some glass you, you see that's colored. It's like all the, a lot of the individual pieces um, vary. The, the, uh, within there, what? Um, within the, the, each <coughs> little piece. Correct. There, there was the process that they had here is they actually put out a powder on the window with some of these designs and then baked them. Is that correct, Lois? The, bl the black is the color, but the, all of the other colors are actually the glass. So, so you have the color, the, the reds, the blues, the yellow, and then, then they put the black powder on top to get the designs, and then they bake it some more? It's fired. <coughs> fired. So, right. so you all know the brasses there are. And they, they did the stained glass um, dove and fired here. Right, but, but beyond that, the, look at the behind Jesus there. Those radiating lines mm -hmm. and that blue glass. That that's part of the black powdery? Mm, no, I don't think so. The white ones? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're looking yeah. 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 Like, like, like this up here would be the, the, the blue left. This What's fired on is those black, the, the black the, to give it the faces and give it the the, the, the designs. The designs, yeah. right. But the glass itself is incredible. Any uh, explanation of that? So we're talking about these, these, these blue here on the side. Yeah, but in that thing particularly, but in many of the things, there's a variation in each. I think, I don't know the answer to that question. I'll bubble. <laughs> so right, right now, just speculation. Um, that it's just variations of the black, the depth in it, uh, uh, some of it's real thin, some of it's thicker. <clears throat> okay. I don't know the answer to that one. That's, okay. that's one I'll, I'll see if I can find out. Yeah. Yes? So the flag, the flag symbol, I, what is that? Or the flag is... That, that's the banner of victory? The banner of victory. That's what they call the banner of victory. You see that a lot um, in um, artwork. Um, it's not the, the Lutheran flag. <laughs> I'm sorry? It's not the Lutheran flag. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Remember back in 51, we were what? The LC? LCA. LCA? <clears throat> Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, this is less, more of an observation than a question. It strikes me that that cross end at the very bottom. I noticed this like on, I think it was Good Friday, like two years ago or something. When they turned out all the lights, that cross, because it's white, I don't know whether the glass is, it looks like it's illuminated actually. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just, I focus on that all the time, particularly if I'm having a hard time staying away from the sermon. Yeah. <laughs> Quite often then, huh? <laughs> <laughs> 
Yes, I, I, I do agree that I have noticed that as well. And that, that just, it's, it really, for lack of a better term, pops. <clears throat> when, you, when you look at that, that's, you know, the, on the right, the veil of Isaiah, and on the left, too, you know, the, the whites really, really stand out. Good question. Good conversation. Any other questions on the center one? <clears throat> Excuse me, as you can tell, I'm trying to get over a cold, I apologize. So let's, uh, um, let's talk a little bit about the right one. And there we have um, some stories within this, this particular lancet as well. Um, the bottom is we have uh, um, uh, Elijah and his chariot of fire ascending, ascending to heaven. Again, it's, you, you don't notice it until you actually sit down and just look at it by itself. So again, this particular one is, is, is the, the, the Holy Spirit landscape. And above that one is my other interesting, one of my favorite ones, um, is a pomegranate. So that's an interesting story also. I had to do some research on why, why a pomegranate. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and then what I found, that the pomegranate is a symbol of the resurrection and the hope of eternal life. Because of its abundant seeds, it can also symbolize royalty in the church, where the seeds represent its many believers who are made up of one universal church. So you kind of have Jesus as the outside and we're all the seeds uh, within the pomegranate. And this is also another one where you actually take some close looks at some other churches, you will see the pomegranate there quite often. Um, it says here, Christianity adopted this theme and the pomegranate associated with the resurrection of Christ and of believers instead of the annual resurrection of the crops. The seeds bursting forth from the pomegranate are also likened to Christ bursting forth from the tomb. So next time you have a pomegranate, <laughs> you think about it from this viewpoint. So, um, <clears throat> how many people knew that that was a pomegranate? <laughs> that's, that's one. Was it? Oh. Uh, that's just one of the interesting ones. Uh, you know, again with the, um, the pelican. It's also interesting how. <clears throat> Different people look at these images and make up their own stories. <laughs> so, um, those of you who know Scotty Ireland, remember Scotty? He used to say, that's the clown image that he always called it the clown image. <laughs> looks like a clown. <laughs> he said it was kind of like an angry clown. But it's an oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like it better as a pomegranate. <laughs> Interesting when you, when you actually take a look at it a little bit more in detail. It's, it's not just Christ resurrecting and has his resurrection, but what's all behind it? What, what just makes it interesting? Um, and this is, I'm going to read right from what Pastor Neebling put down. Um, Crowning these medallions is the glorious vision of the ris rising Lord ascending from the empty tomb. Beside which are his discarded crown of thorns and robe of mock royalty. The detail that he put into these is just, it's amazing. Um, and while one, and if you look up at the sh soldiers, you will actually see one sleeping. It says, while one soldier sleeps in his armor and with his blood-stained spear. Mm -hmm. 
The other soldier guarding the tomb drops his useless sword in the blinding light from that realm wherein the might and the wealth and the wisdom of the world are no avail. Just the detail and what, what he has and what he put in there. The drop sword, drop sword, or drop sword, and just flying the Bible out to the right, resurrecting the king. Just so, and then of course on top of that, we have the Holy Spirit dove, Pentecostal dove that we're all familiar with. So, any questions on this Lancet? So I hope that when you come into church now, you look at it a little bit differently uh, when, when you see these. Yes, ma'am. Uh, are these um, windows protected some way from the outside? Like, could someone take a stone and throw it and it break? I believe they could. I, I don't think there's a panel of glass on the outside. Uh, we don't have anything on the outside like that, but um, this glass is um, it's thicker than other normal glass. Um, so often with stained glass, it's, it doesn't have this kind of thickness. In fact, that's one of the issues people have brought up over the years, so you don't have to bring it up again if, if you hear this right now. Um, people have had the wonderful idea that we should have big bright lights on the inside here so that when people drive by on the outside they can see the glass as they drive by. It doesn't work very well. You don't get the light through very well. So we'd have to have big spotlights on the inside. That would really look terrible up here. Um, plus, the, the opposite idea has been proposed. We should have lights on the outside so that uh, when we have our Lenten services at night and our Monday, Thursday, Good Friday services in the dark, that this would all glow. But again, the glass is really thick, and so it doesn't work real well to, to do that. You have to have some very great lights. So, um, so we've talked about that, but I don't know if that has allowed us to avoid any sort of damage over the years. Um, God, God forbid anything would happen, but we haven't had that problem, and uh, hopefully we remember well. I know some churches do that, though. Put a plexiglass on the outside or something mm -hmm. like that. Usually it doesn't look very nice on the outside either. I imagine it would affect the light, too. Like, Cut we would, the yeah, we wouldn't get, we, this wouldn't look near as pretty now because it would diffuse the light different, or we wouldn't have that intense white cross or whatever. Right. <clears throat> and what's, what's interesting is I, I stated before, when, when you're done, go up to the con and you, you can actually see how, it's, how the, the windows are hung. They actually have steel bars over there, and they're, they're wrapped on with wire. Um, it's, you can get right close. You can see how the, the coloring and the, the black shading <coughs> is done. Within the, um, the, the book that uh, we have, there's a, um, a little excerpt from a book called The Beauty is Inside by H.W. Uh, Gokul. And I, I just want to read it because it kind of really, when it, it makes you look at these particular windows. It's a little bit different. <clears throat> said, two high school girls had spent most of their Saturday, Sunday afternoon in a le leisurely stroll through the downtown section of the city. Suddenly they found themselves directly in front of a huge cathedral, looking at the lofty uh, stained glass windows, which their arch teacher had told them to be sure to see. One of the girls stopped short and remarked disparagingly, nothing beautiful in that. Just a lot of dirty glass. A little old lady overhearing the remarks walked up to the girls and said, you can't judge the beauty of an art glass window from the outside. Why don't you go step inside? The girls went in and stood motionless and enthralled, and their face, faces bathed in a symphony of color which was pouring through from the stained glass windows. The little old lady was right. You you just cannot judge a stained glass window from the outside. So, um, so those are the three lancets. Any question on those? Now, as you know, we have a bunch of windows throughout. Each one 
has their own story. And if you actually sit and look at it, you don't need the book to understand what the story is. Now, the, as we said, when this church was originally built, we had the two windows here. Those ones to the side of the altar. Where this opening was, they went into the commons. There's four of them that are way up high, and there's two of them that are along the wall. So you can see up high in, in that, that window, those, that's where four of them went on up. And then two on the side. And each one of those has their own story. Uh, uh, an example here, this particular picture right here, uh, just by looking at it, anybody have a guess what this might be? I'll explain. We have a person who's down hurt, we have someone helping them, and we have two people walking away. Good Samaritan. Good Samaritan. So, uh, you know, this particular story, you'll see throughout them, you know, the, there's a lot of similarity in the windows, but then in the middle, each one has their own story. And this one, if you hit, there's ten of them. The law is ten commandments. So as you go through, you, you'll be able to see, guess, and just by looking at them, what the story is. There's, um, that side, there's Garden of Gethsemane, is over there. And I forgot what the other one was. Uh, the sowing of the seeds. So, uh, I, I, again, feel free to walk around and take a look at them. Um, within the book, they explain each window and each one has their story behind it and what uh, <coughs> Pastor Neagling brought up to that. Um, to, to, to design that window. So I was, I was mainly going to spend my time on here. We have, uh, unfortunately, we have the choir that we're going to have to get out here for shortly. But anybody have any questions on these three windows? <coughs> um, I really think, again, you know, take a look <coughs> at it from a different viewpoint. You know, now you can actually see the stories behind it. And, and what's that? Yes, ma'am. Any idea what it costs? You know, I asked that question, the, the gentleman who told me uh, the story about this was purchased by one family. Um, to answer your question directly, no, I do not. They did not divulge what the cost of the windows were. Oh, no? No. And what, in what country were they made? Uh, in a little country called Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the windows were made yes. in Milwaukee? Yes. Why <laughs> oh, didn't know that? Yes, uh, by the, uh, um, I don't know, what's the name of the company, T.S. Yes, sir. Um, yes, sir. Esser, T.S. Esser. Oh. So yeah, they, they, they were made designed here in Milwaukee. And that, that, I, I did some research on that, and that company was subsequently purchased by a company out of Chicago. <coughs> it looks like 20. I'm just going to pass them around if you want to look at them. Now, a little more on the, the variation in the color that you see up there. All stained glass could be either a solid color or it can have variations, stripes and streaks okay. and mm -hmm. so forth in the color. Um, so it looks to me like they have chosen uh, pieces of glass that have a little variation so I'll, I'll by the, by the around, crucifixion. The, around the crucifixion there. And that they've chosen a piece of glass that had streaks in it to, uh, to fit that place so they use that piece of glass but normally and I also I'm afraid that Pastor Chris's uh, photography <laughs> some of the pictures make that enhance that color variation if you look at it real close it's not as not as great as it looks in some of the pictures yeah. you guys all know Ed Ross? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> So does that mean every every detail is predetermined? Oh yes. This 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 is an artwork because this this is a long laborious process of cutting the glass, you know, lay, laying out the design, cutting the glass, <clears throat> firing whatever designs need to be put into it, and then the then actually putting it into the, the, the structure. All of the what folds and the robes, the hand features, the face features are, are painted on with a 
special powder that, that is then fired so it stays permanent. It won't peel off. How no. long did it take? I do, it does not state how long. Um, it does just, um, all that it says in here is that they put together the team um, in 1950, I believe it was. Now where's the council? It doesn't even give a date, it just says a committee was appointed. But, um, so I, I do not know. I imagine it took some time, you know, from, from beginning to end. Yeah, it takes two years. And again, you know, take a look at the, the pictures down in Fellowship Hall, that hallway. It's, it's just interesting to see <coughs> the original um, church one with the, the, the tripart windows um, just having clear glass in it versus stained glass. Any other questions? Thank you. You're welcome. Thank yes. You. I think what's interesting is my... My parents and family were here for the original church. This this church? Yes. That is that is wonderful. I'm I'm just enthralled by the idea that we have our original church, our original building, is totally enveloped by our current building. I can remember standing outside trying to get in on her confirmation class or graduation for my brother and I was so proud he couldn't get in. Um, it mentioned that in um, one of my research books that I have, there's a um, couple books on the history of St. Matthews and they talk about lines of people trying to get into the church. Um, it's true. So do you remember Pastor Niebling? Yes, I do. He was a very good pastor. <laughs> Anybody else remember Pastor Niebling? Was he a fire and brimstone guy? Yes, he was. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he was. Because <laughs> you, you have to you know, bear in mind with the history of St. Matthew's, which I, I, I enjoy talking about. Pastor Chris is only the fourth lead pastor we've had. We're coming up on 100 years. So that is, you know, that really tells you a testament of this church and, and how, how well we get to stay together. So, Any other questions? Well, thank you very much for your, oh, yes. Do you, do you think these can be reproduced? Do you think the skill set is still? I, I imagine the skill set is there. Can they be reproduced? Yes. We <laughs> what the cost of it is. Kevin Slager, who works in this kind of department. You want to say anything about stained glass today? <clears throat> Here, there's a mic for you. Uh, I actually work for Conrad Chef Studios in New Orleans, and uh, I actually do, we make stained glass windows every single day, so. Um, as beautiful as these. Well, sure. Um, <laughs> these guys uh, did a great job. We got, you know, with the pictures that Pastor Chris has taken, that would be the majority of the battle, if, if anything were to happen to something, to reproduce them with the photographs that he has. Uh, we have a talented artist and craft that can actually reproduce them, sure. <laughs> but only because of the photographs he has. Uh, we can get the colors. They still make a lot of similar glasses today. And uh, uh, just a couple notes about questions that were asked too. If you look at the halos, um, Christ actually had his own special halo. Uh, resurrection, window in the center lines it, and uh, to the right, he has a special triptych halo that no one else actually gets to have. Uh, that's that's a special halo that's reserved just for him. That represents the Holy Family. So, uh, and along with what Pastor Chris said, the saints. Uh, sainthood for all the other people that have halos, but uh, that's a special uh, halo reserved for Christ. And um, what else? The, the colors in the glass, just like uh, he said, where you know every sheet is different. Some sheets go from thick to thin, so the colors can vary. Even if it's a single color blue sheet of glass, the thin parts are very pale. The thick parts are very deep in color. So that I think a lot of the glass that they used might have been uh, Blanco glass. I don't know if you've ever heard of the company Blanco. Uh, they're from America too, um, but a lot of their sheets of glass really changed in uh, thickness and which changed the color and then also their streaks of color in certain gla glasses as well uh, in the like the certain reds and uh, the yellows I saw where they actually took bands of color and hand mixed bands of color through the glass and that'll give a lot of diversity in each uh, color of the glass. So were they radiating out from Christ there on the cross, would they then 
hard to clasp thinner and together? No, I think that's just careful hand selection of each piece. Uh, they used to put the okay. they used to put the the design up in the front window, and then they'd hold the sheets of glass up to the front window with the pattern for each individual piece of glass, and hand select each specific piece of glass mm -hmm. so that it radiated color wise out from mm -hmm. where they wanted it to. So. Mm -hmm. two, two questions I have. Um, sure. First of all, um, someone mentioned how long it would take to put something like this together. Sure. Uh, what would what would your um, well, if you look at it, like one of these side windows, um, just one line from the side window, that would probably take a couple of days just to put it together. Once it's already painted, it would probably take uh, potentially weeks to paint, um, depending on what's going on. Now, a lot of the design work in the background field is might have been uh, silk screened actually, because there's so many repetitive elements in there, so they were able to actually um, screen print a bunch of those borders and things like that to speed up the process, plus to keep it very consistent from one window to the next. So that helps you get the process people so use that today actually um, to mass produce some certain pieces. But anything that's not um, similar from one to the next is all hand painting and takes a considerable amount of time. Sometimes during the firing process you'll have it down and put it in the kiln and it'll break and repaint and again. <laughs> so uh, there are certain you know, inconsistencies in the glass and how, how it's fired down the line that'll cause it to break. What is the powder that makes it black? Is it magnesium? Um, no, there's different different uh, chemicals used in that. It does contain some really small powder glass in it. And it's actually a paint that gets mixed up with certain mediums of varnish or water or oil and things like that. Like agar oil you can be used. Um, but it's mixed together and put on with a paintbrush. Okay. Uh, different shape of brush. Like uh, a lot of the shading that you see in some of the drapery um, is they put it on, they cover the whole piece of glass liquid paint and then they let it dry and they come back and they stipple and they pull out highlights and things like that. But yeah, there is powdered glass in there so that when it's fired in the kiln, it becomes one with the base glass. And my, my other question would be, and you may not know the answer to this, but it was kind of brought up. What would be a guesstimate replacement value of this? Would it be in the tens, the hundreds? Easy, what I would do just as a, as a Based on you try to figure out how many square feet you have, something with this level of detail and pain would probably be, I don't know, somewhere between six and eight hundred dollars a square foot. Wow. So to reproduce something like that. So if we, you know, if we were to do like an insurance estimate to cover it, we're not actually licensed appraiser, but I can give up replacement value. So yeah, we'll just figure out how many square feet you have. And, you know, you can do simple flash from hundred to two hundred dollars a square foot, but something that has so much paint on everything is definitely on the higher end. Well, thank you very much for that detail. That's mm. simple. <coughs> I was hoping you'd be here today. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Well, thank you very much for stopping by. And uh, if you have any other questions. Uh, if you do want to keep the book, they are 20. Um, and we'll have them out available. And even if you didn't bring money with you and you just want to leave us an IOU, that's fine too. So. Thanks very much, and thanks to Al for being here in class. Appreciate it.